Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Say fresh wind. Hallelujah. Fresh anointing. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's turn to the book of Acts. And we've been studying in the book of Acts. And it's, uh, I call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit, amen? And in this season and this time that we're in, it's such a profound time for us to be in tune as to what the Holy Spirit is doing, amen? Let's look at the book of Acts. Let's just, first, let's look at Acts 1. I want us to peruse through the scriptures so we can lay the foundation. Acts chapter 1. Let's look at, at verse 8. Amen. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and I'm reading from the Amplified. It says, but you shall receive power, ability, efficiency, and might when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends, the very bombs of the earth. This power that Jesus was speaking of is the Holy Spirit. Um, I can't say enough that this is his dispensation. We see the acts of God during the Old Testament. We see what Jesus did when he walked the earth. And when he left, he says, I will give you a comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. And God's been speaking to us about mission impact. And we can't get that mission done without the Holy Spirit. Amen. We must continue as a body of believers and as people of God to rely on the Holy Spirit where it says, not by might, not by the Spirit, but by the Spirit of the Holy, by the Holy Spirit, not by power, not by might, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. And so then, as we go over and look at Acts three nineteen, and I haven't forgotten, we're going to do our those of you who have tithes, you do your tithes tonight, and then those of us uh, offering. Um, as I wrote up my offering tonight, um, I wanted to lay this scripture, it's Acts 3.19. And this is why I wrote up my scripture, Acts 3.19 and Acts 4.30 through 37. And I've been laying hold of that scripture, and Pastor Adam and I have been laying sowing seed upon Acts chapter 4 for quite some time. So I'm not wishing and hoping we've already seen the manifestation of it and God is just calling for for a time to reveal his presence and I have here fresh wind fresh oil and fresh anointing fresh wind fresh oil and fresh anointing in Acts 3 19 it says repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The time of refreshing comes from the presence of the Lord. It doesn't come when you get a, va a vacation. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm getting ready to go on a cruise, but, um, you know, that's supposed to be time of relaxation. They call it R&R. &R. But I'm talking about a time of refreshing that comes from the Lord. 
doesn't come when you have a massage. All those things are good, but I'd rather have a refreshing that comes from the Lord. And part of that refreshing comes about because the people of God repent and come in right standards with him. And then those are those, there are those who we walk in repentance and we know that the adversary do, doesn't like that because we are the righteous. So he tries to burn us down. Amen. But God has stopped by to say, but I can give you times of refreshing. Hallelujah. Times of refreshing. And that's what he's calling the body of Christ and doing here today. It says, throughout this present age and until Christ return, God will send times of refreshing, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to all who repent and are converted. Notice it says repent and converted. We have a lot of individuals doing repentance, but where's the converted part? When Paul on the road to Damascus repented, there was a conversion that took place in the life of Paul. Amen. When Jacob finally realized that God was God, there was a conversion that took place in his life. He went from being a trickster and a supplanter to being who God had called Israel. God is calling forth the church to a time of refreshing. That time of refreshing, could you imagine, I actually went back and looked at, I stayed up last night and I watched the message from last night. Now how is it I can, I've watched myself and I'm the one that preached the word. And some of you don't even bother to go back and look at the tape, even when you haven't even watched it. And then you wonder why some of us walk in what we walk in. Amen. Why? Because I'm just a vessel being used from God. Hallelujah. I sat there as I watched the video, Jan, shaking under the power of God because of the revelation, the word of God coming off of the message. So the Father is talking about this time of refreshing and the piece where I took uh, Minister Reed's pocky book and I, I, I looked at that and God continued to start speaking about that how we like to carry we carry these burdens around if you're carrying burdens around you can't feel refreshed but some of those self-induced burdens if we truly repent of them then you experience a time of refreshing we don't understand it. Your sin caused weight to be upon you. And you wonder why you're under so much pressure. Some, it just calls for a time of true repentance. And then those heavy burdens become lifted. And, you know, it's just like, you know, some of you, when you're in the deliverance meeting, and you hear me say, yeah, you, you feel lighter? Well, we don't always have to wait till the deliverance meeting roll around. We can just call upon the Holy Spirit and get in a posture with God to, to release some things. You know, whether it's simple, somebody might have made you mad and you've been holding on to it and didn't know. So that's why God come by to prick us because he said, I want you to be in a time of repentance. Amen. Somebody may have misunderstood you or what have you. You've been holding on to that. And God says, no, my, I want my people to walk in repentance. In the book of Psalms 66, verse 18, and I shared this with the radio broadcast, and um, those of you that know me, you hear me say this all the time. And if individuals don't get anything else. They need to get this and have an understanding of the type of God that we serve. In the book of Psalm 66 and 18, it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. He says, I will not hear you. The only prayer that God 
hears from a sinner is that of repentance. Just that plain and simple. He doesn't hear anything else. It says those who take pleasure in unrighteousness have no hope of answer prayer. Do you know how serious that is? No hope of answer prayer when they call on God. God wants us separated from sin. Only then will he respond to us as a father to a son. Only then. Only then. Think about some of you in the room that are parents, if you are a proper type parent. You know, some parents just let their children get away with anything, and they still just give them whatever they want. I'm not talking about that type of parenting or appeasement. The Bible says you spare the rod, you spoil the child. They grow up not learning how to respect authority. And thinking somebody's supposed to give them something on a silver platter. Amen. My boys know I don't reward disobedience. <laughs> I corrected someone that wanted to give one of my boys. I said, listen, no, he doesn't receive anything. Because we don't reward disobedience. And somehow we think that God does. And he doesn't. Not so. Not so. And, and I'm just hearing my spirit. God says, tell them everything that they are calling a God blessing is not me. You stop being deceived. You know God is not a part of that mess. You know that. He's not a part of that. But we ever, you know, not in GBF. I say, I know y'all don't do that. You know, those other folks. They go around, oh, look what God bless me with this and God bless me with that. And then us, re us Christians, we get tripped up because now we're looking at them because they said God did it. And you know their life all jacked up. And now you getting off the track that you on. Look at Dick, he just stepped in. He already done, he done, he done, he done plugged in already. And now you thinking somehow that they got something more than you have. Not so. Not so. Hallelujah. But I think God is, 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 is speaking and, and, and talking to the faithful remnant to stay the course. I'm not saying that, we're, you're, that you're going to be perfect, but he's saying stay the course. You know, sin means to Mr. Mark. But God does not tolerate habitual sin. It's, it's in his word, choose ye this day life and death. We hear that, and perhaps because we're not dropping dead right immediately, we think somehow that God is winking at some of that. No. That's just grace working for you. Amen. So then we go over in the book of Acts. And we go over and look at Acts 4. And we get to the end of the book. I just thank God because whether people know it or not, I don't do anything unless I hear from the Holy Spirit. And there's always a confirmation. Now notice we had verses 31 through 36 to complete in Acts 4. Pastor Adam would have been the one to bring it. But then he told me, I'm not going to be here. Now, you know this is the very scripture that I've been prophesying since last year. So is it any coincidence that on this Wednesday that it's here for me to be able to bring, and that's how God began to speak to me and say, you know, I want to do something different on this night. Then notice that on the radio broadcast, the Morning Glory radio broadcast, we've been speaking of true revival, and it speaks of, and we went through the four weeks, about conviction, godly sorrow, repentance, and refreshing. Refreshing. There are those of us 
that you can experience walking with an open, like an open window, it's an open revival. Imagine experiencing that and have a desire for that. Were you so consumed by the Holy Spirit and being able to reverence him? I think that what really, as the children say, what really burns my biscuits in churches and with people in general is that we don't know how to reverence God. We don't know how to reverence that. I'm speaking to my children about that all the time. I think they probably get more rebukes about that than anything else. I rebuked the, the, the five, I, I rolled in it with the fivefold tonight. They didn't know it. But God began to speak to me. I had five young men all squeezed into my Mercedes, and I rebuked them on the way coming over and reference about not to grieve the Holy Spirit and learn to reverence God and recognize what his presence and I kept saying, God, why did you set me up like this? And you know what you had me to do tonight, and you gave me all these extra boys to bring tonight. <laughs> you know, I knew I couldn't stay. They couldn't stay out of my way, so I stayed out of their way. I stayed upstairs the whole time. I said, because, Lord, I don't want to run little KJ home. First of all, KJ didn't have a key to get in the house. And I just think Dante just glutton for punishment. <laughs> and so then the father began to speak to me and say that this generation tra they'll have an understanding of the five-fold gifts that's what he was speaking to me about you guys you need to look in, and look at Ephesians 4 11 through 13 you may not understand everything that I'm saying but you need to do that you hear me KJ get your Bible Look at Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. But just imagine. All five of them can be pastors, but they all stand in an office. I'm going to say, all five, come here, come here, all five of you that roll with me. Now, some of them already been prophesied to what office they stand in. They pretty much know. Turn around and look at. Now, if we let them get away with any and everything, now these will be your future pastors. They may not look like much right now, but if they get an understanding of what God is speaking tonight and saying, get in a relationship with the Holy Spirit, how powerful will they be? All pastor, one with a standing in the office of an apostle, one standing in the office of a prophet, one standing in the office of evangelist, one standing in the office of a pa of a pastor, double fold anointed, and one standing in the office of a teacher. What force? Tell me what force will be able to bring true men of God like this down? that's standing in a gap in the body of Christ. What for us? Now see, if they don't want it, I want it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I was trying to figure it out. I, I know Jesus was the only one that walked in all five gifts, all nine. I'm just like, give it, I, at will, just give them to me. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. You can be seated. Look at Acts 4, verse 30, because we're talking about this unity and this oneness in the Spirit. And I'm saying, because we all in this.
Verse 30 says, By stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. We can't get away from prayer, church. It says, when they had prayed, the place was shaken, and they spoke with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Hallelujah. The multitude of them that believe were of one heart, one soul, not to said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they all, they had all things in common. All things. I want to look at that from the message Bible. As you stretch out your hand to us in healing and miracles and wonders done in the name of your holy servant Jesus, while they were praying, the praying, the place where they were meeting trembled and shook. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued. No, it says continue to speak God's word with fearless confidence. The whole congregation of believers were united, say united, as one. One heart, one mind, they didn't even claim ownership of their possession. No one said, that's mine. You can't have it. They shared everything. They shared everything. Now on your envelope, this made me think of, on your envelope there's a spot in here called benevolence. And Pastor Ben, we've we been talking about mission impact and, and outreach or what have you. That's where I, um, we're going to see what God, that's going to be our overflow. Amen? Why? Because in the area of benevolence, that's where individuals that are in need in the church will be able to come and we'll be able to pull funds from that area. So let me just teach you something about funding stream. Your tithes and offering takes care of all the necessary needs of the congregation. But unless the church get into the area of our overflow in the area of benevolence, that's where we begin to move out in that realm that is here where everyone can have everything in need. For instance, someone, maybe if they're needing food or what have you, well, if we can take money out of benevolence account and we can buy them food, amen. Someone, and we've, we've done this, on a, we've, we've done this, but it's been done because most of the time Pastor Adam and I do it. We do it personally from our funds. Somebody gets in a, a jam or a stuck or what have you, and God began to speak to me and say, but that's not the church. That's us being blessed. Amen? And so he said, we, we have to, this year, 2012, we're going to move and see us function in our overflow. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know, this is the area where people don't understand, you know, how the church function. Amen? And I can feel the devil getting mad. Because <laughs> if you ever get to understand to know how things function in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. So imagine we have $100,000 sitting in the Belevance account. My son Justin needs a car. We can either say, here, go buy Justin a car because he needs to get back and forth from college and he needs to get to the house of God because he's a faithful servant. Someone needs a refrigerator. Someone, that's where, that's taken. That's the household of faith. People, we do it all the time. People get in the fix and they get into jail or something like that. We go in and help get it out. But most of the time, Pastor Adam and I do that. And then people don't wonder why we who we are. Amen. But God says in seven years, he said, I will perfect those things that concern 
GBFIC, so now he's shifting up. And that hit me when Pastor Adam said, we're going to function in our overflow. Function in the overflow. We're going to see God, see the Father do this. We'll believe in God. Every time I pass by there, that, that, that place that's over there on that street, I say, next glory. Where it, fun- it totally functioned. Amen. We're working on going to get some plans for this up sales up here where it can be the next start off here and then we grow. You got to have vision with God. Vision. And this stuck with me. And I don't know how many of you caught it or maybe missed it, but it's worth me stating again. When I was reading about the relationship between Elijah and Elijah, and when it said 75 years, most Christians just live from day to day without a short-term goal or a long-term goal. So when it, that hit me when God said 75. Now let me tell you why. Because 7 plus 5 equal what? Y'all don't know how to add? 12. What year in? 12. Government authority. So it got my attention. So immediately, let me tell you what I did. Immediately when God said 75 years of the prophet, um, they, it, it, of the time period of 75 years, I began to take my age, subtract it from that time, add it up to get, okay, that's 63, that's 63 more years. I'm like, okay, that equals 109. See, but how many of y'all just missed that? Because none of you hear me say I'm going to reevaluate when I get 80. But then God just gave me some revelation in the word of God. I'm like, wait a minute. But think about it. Maybe you won't live your life any kind of way if you knew that God had a plan for you to get the work done in the kingdom over a 75-year period. Think about how many of us, you know, now let me tell you what I start thinking about. Because I'm, I'm laying hold of it. I'm believing. If Jesus Christ don't come back, then I'll be around here till I'm 109. Now, but then I said, God, he showed me. I said, now I can't be around here looking all wrinkled. You know, like a paper bag. I had seen a paper bag roll it up. Fold, I, roll it up. I, and I said, what's that paper bag? I said, now I can't be around here looking all wrinkled. Because, see, the older you get, it said we start off as a prune, but the older you get, because of the less water intake, you'll turn out to be a prune. So that's why you're supposed to drink, uh, older people need to know they have to drink enough ample amount of water because your body will begin to desire not to have as much water as maybe as when you was younger. So that means that I really got to take care of myself. See, if you thought that you was going to have to live, be here a hundred uh, live to be a hundred. You can't wait till you get eighty years old. And with this revelation that God is speaking right now, that means these young folks over here. And I begin, God began this downroad revelation. Who's to say that the days will not go back as to when people was living three and four hundred years? Who's to say that that won't happen? I told you there are realms in God we have not even tapped into. Brother Gary, that's revelation that God has not even begun to release yet to a certain generation. Who's to say that? I'm causing you to think. Wouldn't you take better care of your body? Wouldn't you do some things different? And then I got like this. Wouldn't you now begin to believe God for the impossible? If you know you got 75 years to get it done. But if we don't start believing, that's what I like about the Copelands and the Copelands, my spiritual part, I learned so much. They say, you guys don't have to wait 40 years to get what we have. We don't have to wait. If we take the revelation and the knowledge right now, if we, if we, this generation, think about it. We're already teaching to believe to be debt free. It should be nothing that by the time you get 50 and 60 years old, you're debt free. 
Because you start believing for that when you was 40. That's when you got the revelation. Or when you was 12. If you was 12, you start believing that way. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a miracle because you're 18 years old and you debt free. It won't be a miracle because you're believing on the word of God and confessing the word of God since you've been 12 years old that you can go and purchase your first house at the age of 21. That's not impossible. Pastor, I don't know our first house and we was only 24 and 25. So how is that? That's not nothing grand for God to do for somebody that's 21 years old. But we start believing. So here it is, you're thinking, oh, I'm 40, I'm 50, and maybe it's too late. And God says, think again. Y'all got some revelation over there y'all want to share? Come on, come on, daughter. Give her the mic. You can come on up. I seen the anointing, though. I was already, I, I was preaching, but I seen her. I can pick up on the anointing. The blue mic. Testing. Okay. This lady's name is Ernestine Shepherd, and she is 74 years old. And the article says she's in the best years shape of her life. My God. And they do show a picture of her. This is the picture. Oh my God. Y'all need to, you need to pass. <laughs> oh my God. She done put all us to shame. With a six pack. Wow. <laughs> Pass it around so people can see that. 77 years old and in the best shape of her life. Now, you know, I'm going to get a copy of that and I need to mail it to my daddy because my daddy has a, he, he, he's, he, he's very competitive. He's, if I show that to him, He's talking about he's ready to go at 7. He's sure enough going to change his mind. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Wow. So here it is, God. See, and the Holy Spirit can keep you young. It, it says, cover us in the beauty of your holiness. The beauty of your holiness. Then it says in verse 33, and with great power gave the apostle witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace came upon them all. Look at that grace. Great grace. Look at your neighbor say great grace. Great grace came upon them all. Remember I said the same grace that saved is the same grace that can keep you. And there you go, verse 34, and neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. And so it turned out that not a person among them was needy. Those who owned fields or houses sold them and brought the price of the sale. Notice, one accord, one heart, one mind. Think about it. I was thinking about in here. If all of us in here was to go home and we lay tables up here and bring things that you have no need of that's in good condition or even perhaps brand new. And I was going to do that, but I didn't have time. Just going to bring stuff. And it says those that need. And if you just laid it out, somebody else may need that, which you did not need to need that. You see how everybody... What is the outfit? What is shoes? What is, I know I can just go in my closet, my, my toiletry closet or coupon or whatever, and just lay some things out. And I'm quite sure someone in Congress said, well, you know, I'm in need of that. Oh, I'm in need of that. Oh, I'm in need of that. That's the mindset of, 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 of in the kingdom. Because that's what it means to be blessed. Bring it to the back. They want to sit in the back. God wants us to be, a, be, be blessed so we can be a blessing. Amen? So we can be a blessing. 
so we can help others in the body of Christ. Then it says, and they laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distrib distribution was made unto every man according to as he had need. See, that's see what I just was talking about, the benevolence. I didn't see this till today. I've been reading that and reading it, and God says, the benevolence. Now, on the flip side of that, because you know, folks, God's not talking about just giving a handout to everybody. I'm talking about as it relates from the house of, uh, relates to the house of God. Because, say for instance, you know, share, we say, oh, props, I need to come over. My washing machine is broken. I come over and use a washing machine. I would be able to say yes. But now, share me come over and she got her three children and they all scribble on my walls. Or what? No, we, we're not talking about that. <laughs> Because, see, that's, you have to appreciate what someone has done for you. And I'm preaching real good. I'm preaching real good. So it's just like if somebody say, Prophetess, I have, I don't think nobody has gotten that to ask you. Can I, can I borrow your car? Now, first of all, there are people, girl, you almost have a license. That's the key thing. You can't ask. See, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Because God's getting ready. He's doing something. He's taking care. You can't ask to borrow my car that's over $50,000 and you don't even have a license. You can't ask to borrow somebody's car and then you don't even have insurance. You can't ask to borrow somebody's car if you know that you, you got tickets that's unpaid. You see? But we do stuff like that. Or we wonder why somebody won't, ain't nobody won't give me nothing. Yeah. We done took good care of our stuff. Because then here's the thing. I let, I'm trying to be, oh, I got a big car. I let Shanika hold my car. Shanika don't even have a driver's license. The car get wrecked. Now what? Now I'm the woman of God. I can't get to the church house to bring y'all the word. Now, there's hundreds of people who just been affected because I was trying to be kind. But we do stuff like that. Oh, I'm going to stay right here. That, oh, I'm, 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 no, I'm going to bring them up. I'm going to bring them up a little. Not ghetto. That's be ghetto. Be, be ghetto. Bougie ghetto. Bougie. Bougie. I'm going to make it sound good. Not ghetto. Bougie. Bougie ghetto. <laughs> Bougie ghetto. Bougie ghetto. We're going we gonna to raise it up. But I think we, if we don't raise it up past ghetto. Bougie, boo, boo ghetto. <laughs> so we have to understand, because we got to have an understanding of people misuse and misabuse the system. Oh, see, I didn't know God was going. Go with me to the book. See, people, mm, let me help y'all out. See, we must have get ready to come to some money. Because for God to be speaking this way, in Proverbs 6 and 1, I learned this early on as a pastor. And I seen the effects of it. Because, see, if you're always giving, 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 it says, my son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth, and thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. You say, Pastor, what does all that mean? Surety for a friend. The verse warns against being surety for a friend. That means always being there. You know, I call it sometimes people being enablers. Which means accepting responsibility for someone's debt. If he or she fails to pay it, this makes the financial situation of the co-signer. Come on, how many of us done probably co-signed for somebody and you wish that you wouldn't have done it? <laughs> Look at the hands up there. And you wish that you didn't do it. Hallelujah. 
That sound real good. Oh, you know, your children go, oh, mama, I'm going to pay you. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm going to get my paycheck. I'm going to give you that paycheck back. Oh, mama, I'm going to make sure I pay my rent. Yeah, you just do this for me. Just sign this here for me. Oh, you know. And you go ahead and do it. It said the cosigner dependent upon the actions of the friend and subject to events beyond his or her control. It can lead to poverty and the loss of lifelong friendship. This does not mean, however, that we should refuse to help someone who is in real need of the basic necessities of life. But we should give to the poor rather than lend to them. See, you didn't know that. You think every time because you're giving somebody a handout, a handout, a handout, a handout, you're not helping them. Matter of fact, the Bible says you keep doing that, you're going to end up with poverty. Because first of all, they're not learning. You're sowing into what? Poverty. You're sowing into poverty. So we have to understand that. We must learn to be wise steward over what God has given us. It's all right when people, even, let me tell you, every time I give out, I give out money all the time to those in the home. The, I have a right to offer Jesus Christ to you if you want my money. But so many people don't understand it. They just think they give it to The first I said, what's your name? I was at the, went to, matter of fact, let me tell you how God, I was already going to, to retrieve some funds to help somebody out. And I normally don't want to be, I wouldn't be in that, you know, going in. And this gentleman was standing out there sitting when I came out. And I was walking out because I was on a time crunch. And I heard like a little whisper. And the, it was just a little whisper. I got in the car. Let me tell you how to it. He says, he says something to you. So I had to get in the car, turn around, roll up on it. I says, did you say something to me? He said, yes. I said, how did you get in this, how did you get in this predicament? I know people probably tripping but they probably said, who in the heck is this woman? He said, and I mean the spirit of truth get released. So he said, he says, ma'am, I'm going to tell you the truth. I got a job that I'm going to start at Popeye's. He said, but I need $25 in order to get my cooking license. I said, do you know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior? Yes, ma'am. I said, well, let me pray with you. And first of all, I like to anoint my money. I had to anoint it with that oil. Put it in my hand like that. Here my Go on on by my business. Let the ministering angels take care of them. Now, if he didn't want me to pray with him, then he didn't need my money. I work hard for my money. Hallelujah. And I know, see, this is what you understand. I know that I don't get a 100-fold return when I give to the poor. The word of, see, you didn't know that. The word of God says he will repay you for what you gave. Oh, I'm teaching real good in this, this Presbyterian church. Huh? Yeah. So now you'll rethink and understand about we got to what? He says, preach, give the gospel to those that are poor in spirit. Raise them up. Think about when you was in this room where you had poverty and lack, and we gave you the word of God and taught you how to have faith. The church is not a welfare system. It is the kingdom of God. It can take you out of the welfare system. Hallelujah. Yeah, you favor with God. That was just a side by Proverbs 6. I guess somebody needed that. We're talking about fresh wind, fresh oil, and a fresh anointing. When John the Baptist came on the scene, he said, repent. When Jesus Christ came on the scene, it was still repent. And, and, and where did that, that, same anointing is in the earth today because it was leased from Elijah. The spirit of Elijah is the spirit of repentance and reconciliation. The father said it to me this way as I was driving. He says, repentance, reconciliation brings refreshing equals revival. So the same spirit of Elijah, that same spirit, notice John the Baptist function in it. Notice Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, function in it. The spirit of Elijah. The repentance and reconciliation and a time of refreshing. So 
So God has spoken to us, not only corporately, but also individually. And those of you who are watching from the web, there's going to be a special anointing that will be double to penetrate through the airways because you're watching on the web rather than being here in this room. Let's stand to our feet. There's some business with the king.